No. Yeah, then I'll start with the mathematics. <coughs> The first, or maybe call it the zeroth part, is motivation. <coughs> so the thing is, our lecture is about Lie algebras, but if I define what a Lie algebra is, it's kind of weird, and it's not clear why people would be interested in such an object. <coughs> and so this chapter gives some of the missing link, and explains why people would study Lie algebras. In fact, now I only give a very brief introduction. And on Thursday, I'll give a more, um, give more detailed material on this. So because uh, first Thursday, so I didn't want you to have only two days to work on these exercises. So the first exercise session will actually be Thursday next week. And this Thursday, there will be an optional extra lecture where I'll explain about the, this motivation chapter, so it's optional if you miss it, never mind, I'll not come back to this, but it'll help you understand why people are interested in these Lie algebras. <coughs> so for now, we start just with an observation. Many groups, groups just as you know it from your introductory classes, set with a <coughs> operation. They have a, a an additional st geometric structure. What I mean by this, I'll just explain it by example. One of the first groups, of course, you encounter are the real numbers for the plus operation. So this is a group. <coughs> but this, this is also a line. So this is how you visualize the real numbers, usually. It's just a line. And at some point, there is 0, 1, <coughs> minus 1, and so on. So there is some geometry here. Then consider the group of uh, rotations of the plane. This is, or maybe is, is, is an exaggeration here. Here it's also, it can be represented as a circle. How? Well, just to draw the circle. Say so then here is the identity transformation. And every point on the circle corresponds to a rotation. Well, let's mark the center. Then if I have some point here, there is an angle phi. <coughs> So this point is the rotation by phi. Yeah. So in this way, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between rotations and points on a circle. So the group of rotations obtains naturally a geometric structure, namely a circle. Oh, one last example. <coughs> Let's consider the group of spe special linear group, two by two matrices, say with uh, complex coefficients. So what's that? That's the set of all matrices A, B, C, D, such that, well, the special condition means the determinant AD minus BC must be 1. So I write this differently. AD minus CB 
minus 1 must vanish. Yeah? So this is equivalent to saying that the determinant is 1. <coughs> so this is a variety. in four-dimensional space. So now this is in complex four-dimensional, so a real eight-dimensional space, so it's a bit harder to visualize than these examples. But still, it's some geometric thing. So it's uh, the set of points given by that some polynomial vanishes. So it's a variety, and one might want to study this from a geometric viewpoint. Yeah, and the idea is, of course, one should use the geometric structure <coughs> to study groups, so to study a group, and say G is a group. So. And this gives, this comes in, in several uh, connected ways. Maybe the first thing is a group, um, which is also a manifold, or a differentiable manifold. This is a, a Lie group. <coughs> so one should talk much about those. The problem is then we need to talk about differentiable manifolds also, and this is slightly technical, so one would have to devote an extra lecture to introducing this. So, but um, anyway, for, a, for, a, for an, an idea, a differentiable manifold is just some geometric thing. Are here in this example there is another way which is maybe more accessible because it's more elementary. A group um, which is also a variety. So given by some polynomials. This is uh, an algebraic group. And both of these kinds of groups uh, have a similar theory. And um, they're both, both are very interesting to study. So in, in both cases, The strategy or a possible strategy to study these groups is as follows. Just uh, consider only a small neighborhood of the uh, identity element. This is the identity element is somehow the special element of the group. And well, we can try to see if we just consider the identity element in a small neighborhood, how much about the group operation can we learn? Can we learn by just considering the restriction of the group action to this neighborhood? Or even <coughs> instead of Looking for a small neighborhood, we can look, look for an infinitesimal neighborhood. So we can um, look even closer at the unit element. 
And this uh, amounts, if you do it rigorously, to consider the tangent space. Uh, so. So this is a fu further simplification, not to look at a small, but at an infinitely small neighborhood. And this leads, so I'll explain this in more detail <coughs> Thursday, but essentially this leads to considering, um, so the, the multiplication, this is a map from multiply two group elements and get a different group element. So this yields <coughs> a map which is usually denoted by this bracket notation from L times L to L where L is the tangent space at the unit element of G. Huh? So for example, in the circle group here, we had this would be the tangent space. Yeah, well, for the real line, it's <laughs> kind of hard to draw because the tangent space at the zero element is just the same thing. Well, and for SR2, I can't draw it at all because I can't draw the picture. But this is the idea. So it's some kind of lineari linearization trick. <coughs> and so the, the definition is um, such, such a vector space L. So the tangent space is a vector space here, this line, for example. And the structure, the additional structure we have is this map, this bracket map, and this is a Lie algebra. Okay. And this is um, what we will study in, the, in this course. And it turns out that um, an astonishing astonishingly large amount of the theory of the Lie groups can actually be recovered just by looking at the Lie algebra. So um, this is really a good thing to study. And also note the terminology is slightly non-systematic. So for Lie groups and algebraic groups, in both cases, we can do this trick and study the, <coughs> the tangent space of the identity. But in both cases, we call the resulting thing Lie algebra. So maybe you would want to call this Lie algebra and algebraic algebra. <laughs> Or something, but it's always the Lie algebra. Thomas, do you ever use this strategy of a small neighborhood, or, or in a no, only infinitesimal, right? Only infinitesimal, yeah. yeah. So this is just as a motivation. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. In fact, because the infinitesimal is good enough, so this is, um, yeah. So this is the. I, I try to talk about the baker campbell hausdorff theorem on Thursday, which essentially says that. Even if you only know that this infinitesimal version of the group operation, you know the entire group operation, uh, group multiplication. So you you don't actually need to do this. Okay. Um, yeah. So we start with the. Real stuff. <coughs> so we start with a field.
I usually I think about the field of complex numbers always, but uh, well, as long as the results don't depend on the field, let's just fix an arbitrary field. So what is the Lie algebra? So this is the official definition now, whereas this is just this motivational definition. <coughs> this is a vector space, or an F vector space. With a bilinear map. Uh, let's denote the vector space by L again. So this is from L times L to L. So bilinear, I mean linear as a function of the first argument and also linear as a function of the second argument. <clears throat> and then there are two additional properties which need to hold. First thing is for all elements of the Lie algebra, the bracket of x with itself is zero. So this is usually called alternating. The, the bracket is alternating. And the second thing we impose whenever we fix three elements x, y, z <coughs> of the Lie algebra, then I consider the following identity. First I compute the bracket of y and z, and then I take the bracket with x plus The same thing, but now I shift all the variables by one. So this is x, y, z plus the same thing again, but I shift once more. So I add up all three cyclic shifts, and then this should vanish. So this is the second condition, and this condition is called the uh, Jacobi, Jacobi identity. No? This is it. So this is where it's slightly strange. Uh, these are two conditions, and it's not so clear at the moment why these are interesting. But at this moment, you have to trust me that these come naturally from the, well, from the fact that the <coughs> uh, group multiplication has certain properties. And if you just uh, look at what this imposes on the Lie algebra, then this is exactly what you get. So maybe some more notation and terminology. <coughs> so this map is called um, Lie bracket. or commutator. I'll explain the second name in a minute. So this is, comes from an important example when, <coughs> when the bracket has actually has something to do with commuting elements. So, but even for general Lie algebras, 
So if we are not in this example where the lead bracket actually has to do something with, co with commuting elements, sometimes it's just called the commutator bracket or the commutator. And a use, sometimes a useful notation is the following. Whenever we have an element of a Lie algebra, we define a map, a linear map at x from L to L by the following formula. So at x is a map from L to L. So I have to evaluate this as an element y of the Lie algebra. And this should yield an element, again, of the Lie algebra. Which one? Well, just the bracket, x and y. So <laughs> here it looks as if I had just complicated the notation, but um, say we want to write down the following formula. Yeah. So looks quite complicated here. And with this notation, I can just write it as follows, at x to the 3 y. Because well, at x is the operator which <coughs> brackets y, which, which brackets the element it gets from, from the left with x. So this strange formula just becomes at x to the 3 y. So this is sometimes a useful notation. And also we'll, uh, this uh, at stands for a, a, a joint. Uh, So we'll learn much more about this later also. Uh, how about some examples? Maybe of course our first example is always the trivial example, so that L be an arbitrary vector space. <coughs> and the bilinear map is just the zero map. So commutator of x and y is zero for all x and y. So the zero map is certainly bilinear. Well, it's zero on any combination of elements. So if I plug in two, twice the same element, it's zero also. And well, if I add up three complicated expressions involving the bracket, uh, then I add up three zeros, and so I get zero. So uh, in fact, the fact that this is a Lie algebra is trivial. But that's the first example. So uh, this is a Lie algebra. And such Lie algebras are called abelian Lie algebras because, as you can guess, they are in some connection with abelian groups. Yeah, so that's the first example, slightly boring. So let's go an interesting one. Ah, so this is, uh, maybe I put this on the announcement. So this is well known among physicists also. So we consider R3. <coughs> so 
And what's the commutator of two vectors? This is the vector product. So x times y. So this is, maybe I just recall this. Remember, if I, if I write x is x, I write them as column vectors, x1, x2, x3, and y is y1, y2, y3. Then for the first component, I would have to form this cross product. For the second component, I would have to form this cross product. And for the third component, <coughs> this one. So this is the usual vector product. And um, in fact, this is a Lie algebra. So here it might be slightly less obvious, so let's think about this for a while. First thing, is it bilinear map? Yeah, and this is true, because here, in, well, the components depend polynomially on the components of x and y, and the degree in x and the degree in y is always 1, so um, this is linear in linear in x and linear in y. So let's check for the property of being alternating. <coughs> yeah, this is also um, simple, so you just have to plug it in and then, then you see that on both sides of the difference you obtain the same thing if you're set x equal to y, <coughs> so the alternating property is also simple, but the Jacobi identity is slightly less simple, so I think I wanted to uh, work a bit more on this. So let's check the Jacobi identity. Let's just check the first component for simplicity. The, the other components are <coughs> similar. So the first component, I wrote the formula there. That's y2z3 minus y3z2. Again, Ah, okay, now we, here we need all the components. So that's y3, z1 minus y1, z3, y1, z2 minus y2, z1. So now we only go for the first component, so that's x1 times the third component here, y1, z2 minus x1, y2, z1, minus the third component here, <coughs> times the second component here, so that's y3, 
z1 plus x3 y1 z3. Please stop me if I did any mistake. Which one? Ah, yeah, thanks. Sure. Ah. No. Back minus cap. It's A, uh, A cross parentheses B cross C. Mm -hmm. uh, it's B times A dot C. Ah. I like this identity, and actually. C times A dot C. You plug that identity in here, you may not have to go through all the indices. I'm not sure. I'm just speculating. Yeah. Curious. But it's probably equivalent to what you're doing. I guess so. Yeah, sure. Uh, anyway, so now we did it, so it's uh, <laughs> fine. So let's have a closer look at the thing. So there are two components. So in every monomial, there is x, y, z occurring once. And then in these monomials, there are the indices 1 and 2. And in these monomials, there are the indices 1 and 3. <coughs> so let's just consider the monomials with the indices 1 and 2 occurring here. So for the Jacobi identity, we'll have to consider cyclic shifts. So if I cycle the roles of x, y, and z, So what will this do? Let's look first at the, at the positive monomial. Here the 1 is at y. Then at the next shift, the 1 will be at z. And in the third shift, the 1 will be at x. So altogether in the Jacobi identity, there will be three summons, each of them having two indices 2, 1 index 1. <coughs> And the index 1 is different in each of the summons. So how about the monomial with a negative sign? Well, again, there is one 1, two twos. And here the 1 is at the z component. But after one cyclic shift, the 1 will be at the x variable. And at the second cyclic shift, the 1 would, will be at the y variable. Yeah. So if we add up all the three bracket expressions which we need for the Jacobi identity, <coughs> these will cancel. So the total sum will have six monomials here, three plus and three, three minus, but they coincide, so um, this will cancel. And here it's similar. It's the same thing, just with indices one and three. <coughs> so with some small part of the calculation left out, this proves that uh, fulfills the Jacobi identity. So in this case, it was not so trivial, or maybe if you use this formula, it might be easier. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, yeah? Well, we already learned one other way. <laughs> the two. Yeah, there are in the book. In fact, I didn't plan to, um, to
to comment on this, but in the book there is a chapter on the uh, on the complete classification of low-dimensional uh, Lie algebras. So um, there are more, and we'll yeah we'll get to know more also. So this is the second example. Still seems to be kind of special. So just came up with this. And in fact, but this is uh, well, why this example is so important. This is on the on the exercise sheet. So the, I put the um, the third exercise is also about this Lie algebra and and a different. Uh, <coughs> Way where it occurs, and this will clarify, I think, why this is so important for physicists. Also, please. Um, you, you wrote in a sheet example one point two prime c. Do you mean? Oh, I mean b. Yeah. No. Sorry. What do you mean? Uh, I don't know uh, the, the, the numbering by a b c. Or, uh, am I miss maybe I'm missing something? Are you referring to the one two c? So on the exercise sheets, there is the numbering. Yeah, one point two C, prime C. Yeah. Yeah. So, but what is C? In, uh, this is the it? next. This is. I'm now talking about this. So, example. I'm now talking about the examples. One point two. A oh, was the I trivial. The yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, the, the, the so I'm referring to the lecture. lecture. Exactly. So this was A was the trivial Lie algebra. B was this. Uh, <coughs> Vector product Lie algebra, and now now I'm talking about C. This is the uh, general linear Lie algebra. So we fix any positive integer. And L is the set of n by n matrices with coefficients in, in our fixed field. So I have to define the Lie bracket given two matrices X, Y. <coughs> the Lie bracket is X, Y minus Y, X. Oh, well, the product here is the usual matrix product. And this uh, Lie algebra is known as, or is usually denoted uh, GLNF. So this is the first time these fancy letters show up. And um, yeah, GLNF. But we should also, uh, and it's called the general linear Lie algebra. So, um, ah, and this is the, what I said earlier. In this example, the Lie bracket actually has something to do with commutation because here we take two matrices and then we commute them. We change their order and we build a difference. So, this is uh, why this is called the commuter, also the Lie bracket, because of this example. <coughs> and it's a very important example. So let's um, look into the proof. 
Well, again, the fact that this is um, bilinear is easy, so I won't comment too much on this. If it's, maybe it's not obvious if you look at it from scratch, but uh, you can just write it down and it's, it's actually obvious that this is bilinear. Then the fact that it's um, alternating, this is, uh, this is obvious. You can see this already because then if I plug in x and x here, I'll get x times x minus x times x, so this vanishes. So um, again, the complicated thing here is the Jacobi identity. Well, let's just pick three matrices x, y, z and calculate it. So I just expand both brackets according to the definition. And again, the proof is very similar to, the, to this uh, vector product. <coughs> Lie algebra Let's consider the circled monomials here. And I claim that the circled monomials again cancel after cyclic permutation. Why is this so? Well, x, y, z, and here we have x, y, z. So in fact, the negative monomial here is a cyclic permutation of the first monomial, huh? x, y, z, and here it's also x, y, z, just uh, shifted by one position to the left, or two positions to the right equivalently. Yeah? So if we form the Jacobi identity, we have to <coughs> add up this thing three times. Each time the variables are shifted by one position in their row. So, um, so basically this monomial will assume all cyclic permutations of x, y, z, and this negative monomial will also assume all cyclic permutations of x, y, z. It's just we start with a different cyclic permutation here, but if we add all three of them up, we get all of them, and so they cancel. And with the remaining one, it's the same effect. Huh? Here the start with a positive one. This is z, y, x, and here it's z, y, x. Uh, so the negative monomial is a cyclic permutation of the positive monomial. So if we add all cyclic permutations up, they'll cancel. <coughs> and this proves the Jacobi identity for this uh, general linear Lie algebra. So I finish with some more definitions. So if you had a class in uh, algebra like rings and 
There are rings, basically, then this will sound very familiar. It's just the same kind of definitions we always have if we define some structure. Uh, so which number is this? One, three. So we consider two Lie algebras, L1, L2. Over F. So the important thing is here that both of them are over the, defined over the same field. So we never mix Lie algebras with, where the scalar field is different, but we always, first we fix the field of scalars, and then we consider several Lie algebras <coughs> defined over the same field. And in this case, we can consider a linear map, say phi from L1 to L2. This is a homomorphism. Well, if whenever we pick two elements of L1, we can form the bracket, and this is the bracket of L1, and then apply the linear map. And another way to obtain, an, so this will, is an element of L2 then, another way to obtain an element of L2 is just to consider phi of x and phi of y and compute their commutator in L2. Well, and the condition here to be fulfilled is that these two coincide for all x and y in L1. And then this is a homomorphism. And of course, then we can also define isomorphism. And, and what it means for the algebras to be isomorphic. So So I'm a bit brief here. Do you want me to? comment further on what these lines mean, or is this clear? Good. So now we know when two Lie algebras are isomorphic, and this is, in fact, yeah, one of the exercises to show that two particular Lie algebras are isomorphic. So this is the usual thing. And another usual thing, uh, subalgebras. <coughs> An isomorphism. Exactly. And I, oh, okay, so I say it. <laughs> and for Lie algebras to, to be isomorphic, I mean that there exists an isomorphism between them. Yeah. So this is the definition. I don't write it down because it's kind of, well, I don't know. You, of course, it's not obvious, but if you've seen it for rings, for modules, and algebras and things, then maybe it's natural to define it this way. So next definition, now we only need um, one Lie algebra, L. <coughs> A vector subspace. So we consider, say, K in L subspace, and this is called a, a Lie subalgebra. It 
if well, you can kind of guess it for any two elements x, y in the subspace, k, okay, you want that the commutator x, y is also an element of the subspace. So in particular, the Lie bracket on L induces then a Lie algebra structure on K. Okay? Because this, if we have this property, then this restricts to map from k times k to k, and all the axioms we assumed are trivially fulfilled because they, well, they are fulfilled for, for the full Lie bracket, so for the restriction they are also fulfilled. And there is a second notion which might also be not so surprising if you We've heard some things about rings. A subspace, again, a vector subspace I. It's called an ideal. If, well, we want the same kind of <clears throat> property, but it's supposed to hold for all x in i, y in l. Uh, so this is a stronger property. We have a subspace, and all commutators where one of the <clears throat> factors is in the subspace, but the second one is arbitrary, still need to be contained in the subspace. This is a stronger property, and um, well, that's the definition. Why, why are these notations natural? Maybe a lemma. This will be the last lemma for today and the last so today I'm just introducing all this rather elementary stuff, so the, the language. Um, and just to have some lemma, say um, just do this follows. So part A. If we have some vector subspace K of L. Then this is a Lie subalgebra. If and only if the following property holds, uh, we find a homomorphism say phi from some Lie algebra L tilde to L such that K is the image of this homomorphism. Subalgebras are the images of homomorphisms and similarly if I have some vector subspace I of a Lie algebra, then this is an ideal if and only if, again, there is a homomorphism. from this algebra L to some the algebra L tilde such that this vector space I is the kernel of 
the somamorphism. Yeah, that's actually not uh, difficult, but still I want to prove it just because well, somehow we have to uh, start calculating with these Lie algebras and acquaint ourselves with the, the rules and how we calculate. So let's just uh, get started. Part A, so this is the part about the... <coughs> Subalgebras. And let's consider the implication from the left to the right first. So let K be a uh, Lee subalgebra. Now we have to find such a homomorphism from an arbitrary Lie algebra to our fixed Lie algebra L, such that K is the image. Well, the claim is, of course, why not just take L tilde to be K and the inclusion phi from K to L is a homomorphism. So what's the inclusion? This exclusion is the map, of course, given by phi of x equals x. For all x in K, So it's a linear map. <coughs> so we have to prove that it is compatible with a Lie bracket, but this is trivial in this case. Huh? So as phi is just the inclusion, phi of x, phi of y is the same thing as x, y, and this is the same. So this is an element of the subspace still because we suppose k to be a least subalgebra, so x and y are elements of the subalgebra, so their commute is also an element of the subalgebra. So this is in k, so we can just write this artificially at, as phi of x, y, and that's it. So this is kind of uh, stupid. Anyway, so conversely, <coughs> consider a homomorphism Lie algebras and K is the image of phi. So this is the element, of the, the set of all elements phi of x or x in L tilde, well, by definition of the image of a map. <coughs> and we want to show that K is a Lie subalgebra. So we have to show that it's closed under the bracket. 
So let's say let x, y in k. So then we, by the definition of the image, we find x is 